again. Um, 3,009, well actually this block in particular is really important to notice because each of the houses represents a different style. Um, there are Georgian Colonial Revival, Italian Villa, um, anyway, many different styles represented. Um, and so, I don't know, it's a look at early Richmond suburbs on streetcar lines. The Pollard Park was a buffer for all the commercial area along Chamberlain and Brooklyn Park Boulevard. So. Style building. That was another filling station in the neighborhood. One of the earliest uh, commercial buildings in the neighborhood is just on the other side of uh, First Street, a two story building with a false mansard roof. And that was originally the Stay Clean Inn. Um, it was spelled S T A and K L E E N. I always thought that was sort of a modern thing, but I guess they were doing it back in the 1920s as well. And what we're standing in front of right here is the old firehouse. It was built in 1915 uh, to, to serve the area. It's a craftsman style. Uh, the engines were housed in this central portion and they had living quarters on each side. Uh, now it's run by Boaz and Ruth, which is a, a community-based nonprofit. They also have another store building over there and they do a lot of community outreach. One of the things they do is they provide re-entry services for people who have been incarcerated working their way back into society. Um, they do a lot of job training and stuff. Uh, right here, this is their restaurant catering service. Um, I've not been there yet, but so they have a great early bird breakfast special, so I'm going to come check it out sometime. Um, she knows they're getting, so if you want something to drink, Oh, great. Well, there you go. Very, very nice people here as well. Um, what we're going to do is hang a right on the first half. If I remember correctly, the trolley line that came to this neighborhood came up Meadow Bridge, so we're sort of along that stretch where it ran. Uh, we'll hang a ride on first. If you notice, the commercial buildings ex extend a little ways up Meadow Bridge as well. Uh, but we're going to be getting into uh, the Highland Park Plaza area, sort of Highland Park proper, um, and our next stop will be another little group of commercial buildings up by the park. Hey, I got something to add. Uh, you see that concrete uh, pole over there? That that that's us. That's what uh, the cables for the cable cars used to be suspended oh, from. There you go. So whenever you see those around, there's some crumbling ones on Main Street. But yeah, yeah they're 100 years old. And boy, <laughs> someone show cool. it. That one's in excellent shape. Yeah. Of uh, sure. Anybody likes to run? <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm darling. Hey. Thank you. So we we're uh, doing our bike tour. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. An early streetcar line, actually. Ran up by the park. That's that is Plaza Park, which was built by the developers to promote this neighborhood. And then you had this little commercial board or strip that developed to serve it. Um, that building right there was an early filling station. Um, I don't know 
what the recipes were specifically. I know there was a barber shop, there was a confectionery, like a candy store, there were a couple grocery stores. Um, so you look at it now, and it's uh, maybe hard to imagine what it was like to live in the neighborhood of a streetcar line ranger right come here and take care of your errands. But uh, it's, it's cool to check out. And some of the architectural styles you've got sort of a Art Deco-ish right here. You've got this, you get this sort of Spanish uh, mission, Spanish colonial Did you say that was the uh, filling station? Uh, this was the filling, this very simple building was oh, the filling right. station actually. And it's funny because that was uh, around 1925 that was built. Some of the ones uh, at Six Points have uh, a lot more architectural character. There's Art Deco, there's the craftsman style. And it's, it's interesting that even the early gas stations uh, they, they took some pride, or they, they made it a point to make the buildings distinctive. Oh, yeah. That's really convenient. All right, so uh, as we continue on, you can look over into the park. Yeah. Park Road. Made it from station to station. That's a smart, yeah. We're going to make one more cross across Brooklyn Park Boulevard, which is kind of the hairiest point. Um, so the officer is here to things up for us, so if we could just let him do that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that before you guys. Oh, sort of interesting. One of them, it's still a commercial store uh, and it's open. The one across the street is boarded up and it, it looks like a house. It was built, uh, instead of doing one of these like Art Deco style buildings, they built it to look like a residential building. Um, so you'll, you'll notice it's boarded up on the corner. So we're going to continue down uh, along the old street car line. century, uh, if you're Jewish or Catholic, you need to have consecrated ground to be buried. And so this cemetery was founded after the Civil War by the German Catholics. You notice these names like the Siderdings and uh, uh, oh, a whole bunch of German names, some of which may be familiar to you. And so this was consecrated in 1874. Still a very active cemetery. They kind of overbuilt it's got the most amazing brick wall in the city of Richmond, which was built by a German-American brick contractor. Um, it just, I mean, really, you will not see gates and walls like this on any town, and it runs all the way around the, the cemetery, which means about five acres. Um, I think what's kind of cool uh, about this, it gives you a really nice perspective on the natural topography. Richmond was all kind of cut up into ravines and, and hills, and these plateaus is the get here down to the creek valleys would form spurs. And Chestnut Hill that we're in right now is one of these spurs. It's not very wide. We're at First Street. When you go over to Fifth Street, you're right at Interstate 64. The Shaco Valley uh, bridge comes across. Interstate 64 runs right along. It's a very narrow little district. Barton Heights on the other side of the ravine is a little bit wider. And we're actually going to we're actually going to go down and you're going to cross the uh, um, I've got the current name of the bridge, but the, the old, um, well, actually not so old, the Jackson. new 4th Street Bridge. Um, 
Uh, and then we're going to go down to Shaco Hill, which is on the other side of this valley. This is Cannon's Branch Valley, and the idea, I noticed they started clearing off the right of way these big city right of way you can see the creek through the creek bed. Richmond and Rico Turnpike is a narrow, narrow little road on the other side of that wall. And so the idea is eventually to have a, a, a follow rich, the line of Richmond and Rico Turnpike all the way out to almost the Rico Canyon line, so it's all the way out to the fairgrounds. That's a pretty little valley. Unfortunately, one of the things that's been happening is that there's a lot of illegal dumping that goes on down there because it is kind of isolated. And um, I, I occasionally I'll ride it early in the morning, but there's the, it's a snaky little road. It's not very bicycle friendly, but it's a pretty, pretty valley. And so this really gives you kind of a nice sense of what this is. And we actually cross this over. Um, basically, we, we follow uh, Richard Rico turn back down to Brooklyn Park Boulevard. And and basically, if you kept going straight, you would come right down, down here. Um, the house over there, which has not got a user's interesting building, uh, got the name of the owner. It's 1840s house. It's one of the oldest houses on the north side. And one of the things about, uh, about Richmond was that in the 18th and early 19th centuries, um, a lot of Richmonders with some means had country places, uh, call them what you will, villas, plantations. Some are more working farms than, than others. Some actually had mills. And basically, all of our, our city park, many of our city parks, Ryan Park, Bird Park, Forest Hill Park, were these country places. And that's a, there are a couple of survivors around, and that's a, uh, an original one. Um, so we've come through, when we're up at the, the park, Park House up in Maryland, Milton, that's Highland, the Highland Park District proper. This is Chestnut Hill. Uh, this is also called Highland Park Southern Tip. This was all the town of Highland Park over in this east end on this side of uh, Cannon's Branch. And basically Barton Heights, which we're going to come back up to is on, to is on the other side. The other thing, there's a really neat history and there's a wonderful gentleman History. Uh, these iron crosses are pretty neat. These were the uh, 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 the, uh, the Catholic nuns that served St. Mary's School, which no longer exists. Jackson Ward, the eastern half of Jackson Ward was actually called Little German along 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And St. Mary's Church, I think, was at 5th and Marshall, somewhere kind of down in there. It was torn down in the 1950s. And so these monuments were constructed for them. Obviously they had a standard blank in which they put them out, but uh, don't see a lot of cast iron funerary monuments in the city, in the city of Richmond. Uh, the chapel's a little bit later, it's 1950s, and they actually have a tremendous amount of land. They bought, there's much more land than there's German Catholics to, to, to bury. Um, it still is an active cemetery, it still is very much an active cemetery uh, here, and they do a really nice job of, job of keeping up. But it, gives you a nice sort of feel for the train. And then Cannon's Branch is going to run down into Bacon's Quarter Branch Valley. Bacon's Quarter Branch Valley runs from Shaco Valley way the heck up past uh, Maggie Walker School, uh, really all the way up to the, to the boulevard, up in that area is, is uh, Bacon's Quarter Branch Valley. So that kind of gives you a little overview here. Are these crosses from Trinegar? Uh, oh, I don't know. There were a whole bunch of cast iron cast iron makers in town. It's hard to say. Could have been could have been. I don't know if there are mark marks on them, but there were and the Germans were very involved in the iron iron foundry So maybe with somebody else connection. One quick footnote, the abuse from St. Mary's ended up in St. Edward's out in Bon Air. Okay. And St. and uh, all the German Catholics moved or many of the German Catholics moved to west of Boulevard and St. Benedict's and, and, and is is a successor congregation to St. Benedict's. And the Sheedy family, which you see right behind you, we're out on Jank Road and um, German School and Forest Hill. Yeah. There's a big, there's a huge, um, before the Civil War, about 15% of the white population of Richmond, uh, and I think the state true probably on into the latter part of the century were European immigrants and big groups. There were some British immigrants, but two main groups were the Irish and the Germans. Uh, and German, German Jewish folks, German Protestants, and German Catholics. 
Yeah, Richmond. Go ahead. Uh, Richmond had a, uh, two German newspapers too at one point too. Yeah, it all kind of went south after the you know, First World War. There was a lot of oppression <laughs> in German culture during the First World War, and German language became very unpopular. Yeah, the other cemeteries. Where are they in relation? They're like over what, that way. They're on the other side. Of, yeah, and if you do a little bit of the cemetery history. Since we're going to talk about this, you should go by, and I highly recommend um, check out uh, Hebrew and uh, uh, Hebrew and Shaka, which we're going to go right yeah, we'll by. See those. You'll go right by those. And so, what happened was in the 19th century or early 18th century, uh, pretty much the tradition was to kind of not be too concerned about where you put bodies. Now, there was uh, a church burial ground at St. John's Church, which filled up very early. I mean, by the early 19th century, it was pretty much full. So, and then there's a, a Franklin Street Jewish burial ground, which actually was uh, somebody's backyard that basically was just done for, for burial. And uh, the city did a pretty pretty job with treating African Americans. There, there was the Negro burial ground, which you may have heard about, which is under basically Interstate 95 and a lot of that, and a lot of fill. And then there was a pot, potter's field, um, basically on the other side of this ravine, and they actually plowed through it to build the viaduct across the ravine in the 1890s. Um, and Frederick Von Olmsted came here and described that that thing. So in the period after the uh, War of 1812, a um, number of groups worked to get actually decent burial burial facilities. We're going to go, we will see the Barton Heights cemeteries for a little bit. Those were started in 1815 and the African American community basically saying, we're going to take care of ourselves, you know, and, and these burial associations were formed and they bought land, which was really kind of out in the middle of nowhere, not very accessible, not very easy to get to, long before there was any suburban development. And then uh, Hebrew Cemetery was given to the Jewish community of Richmond in 1816. Basically, the Jewish community was looking for consecrated ground where they could have them bury their folks. And that's been there since 1816. They've expanded a bit. And then Shaco Cemetery, 1822, is a generation ahead of Hollywood Cemetery. Um, it's a generation ahead of Hollywood Cemetery and basically John Marshall and all the people of the early 19th century. What's going to happen is that. Uh, starting with Hollywood Cemetery and continuing after the Civil War, there are going to be all these rural cemeteries, bigger rural cemeteries, um, 10, 15, 10 uh, 40, uh, 40 or more acres, like Hollywood, uh, the city has Oakwood, uh, Riverview, the Catholics will form Mount Calvary, the town of Manchester will organize Maury Cemetery. So the cemeteries get much bigger. So the cemeteries here, including this one, are kind of... Um, earlier relatively smaller cemeteries. This is, uh, I think, about five acres. Chaco, which you're going to buy, is about five acres. So these are a smaller uh, cemetery, but again, trying to migrate out to the to the sort of edges of, edges of the city for burial. But they're really, really nice little green spaces that we've got going. Oh, and there's going to be, on in July, there's going to be, you may say, there's going to be some Edgar Allan Poe event at Chaco Cemetery. Sounds good. There's several that are unmarked over there. I mean, there's black slave. I thought you'll see Barton. You'll see Barton Heights cemeteries. The Barton Heights cemeteries, uh, uh, the basically were condemned and acquired by the city of Richmond, and there are marked monuments. But the city of Richmond in the 1930s basically plowed through and cleared out a lot of the early wooden mar monuments and markers. So a number of the graves in that okay. cemetery are are, are unmarked. There are some monuments in the cemetery, but I think it's thought that there are about uh, maybe as many as 20,000 mm -hmm. people over in Barton, over in Barton Heights cemeteries. There are a lot of tremendous number of people there, and that cemetery has really been reclaimed um, by folk, folks. There's an excellent history of African American cemeteries in Richmond by a woman named Veronica Davis. Um, and if you're interested in cemeteries, put a plug in. You can read my book, which has, I think, a pretty good section on cemeteries. It's called None Such Place in History of the Original Landscape. But, uh, so the cemeteries are really kind of the precursors to the suburbanization. And the other thing that's worth pointing out, this was really inaccessible in the 19th century. The north side was very, very inaccessible. Uh, you basically would have 
could, would have, you know, could, could have taken Richmond Rock to Turnpike. Um, Brook Road was another way you could have could have gone, and the Meadow Bridge Road um, was. But the accessibility here was not really good. And so in 1890, the real estate companies, basically the the transit companies, the real estate companies were all one and the same. So they were, uh, and they it was all uh, sort of a collusion to basically sell real estate, sell uh, uh, tickets on the streetcars. And so these viaducts, which you're going to cross, the predecessors to these, were built, and this basically opened up uh, north side to develop. Uh, there were also uh, Chamberlain Avenue was done in the early 20th century to improve transit to north side. Brook Road, um, eventually there uh, was a colonial road, but there was actually a viaduct for the streetcars that went from Broad Street. If you, there's this really neat classical building at Laurel and Broad. That's the Ashton Streetcar Terminal, which actually there was an elevated streetcar line that came into there. So basically, north side's getting all opened up starting in 1890 running real through, through the Great Depression because of um, uh, streetcar service. And even, you've seen a lot of garages. Um, basically, you know, the early residents here might have had a garage, might have had a carriage, but the term Sunday driver comes from the idea that you just had your carriage and you would use it to get to church. But during the day, you know, everything is, you're going to everything in town. And this was a pretty sweet arrangement because it was a very quick ride down to, down to Broad Street. It's very much in the center of town. There are commercial districts up here that you've seen, but they were very much kind of localized. If you were gonna to go to a theater performance or do any kind of shopping or anything, or really work, there was no employment up here other than the shopkeepers. You would be taking the streetcar right downtown. The other thing about, about the way the streetcars, um, suburbs are in Richmond, they're all basically on the west side of town. They're either northwest, due west, or southwest. That's because we've got prevailing westerly winds. Richmond's a dirty, coal-fired city with paper mills and all manner of bad, belching stuff. So if you look at a map of Richmond, everything's kind of very much sort of westward oriented. And this was kind of kind of the Elysian fields out here. That you're gonna have a big lot that you're not gonna share a common wall with somebody else that you're out here in a more slumberous uh, environment. And so the lots, you know, the lots here are very generous in size. Uh, 40 and 50 foot wide lots compared to a, to a uh, you know, a 20 or 30 foot wide lot down in the center of the town. Notice there are no, deta there are no attached houses up here. Everything is detached. And if you look at the early photographs, everybody had a garden up here. It was pretty uh, and you know, people have kind of kept that tradition going to some extent. Well, you've heard the story about the demise of the streetcar going to Ashland. They pulled up the rails in 1938, sold the steel to the Japanese. No. Well, I don't know about the Ashland line, but basically the streetcar lines were the Richmond lines. All the streetcars were taken out to the uh, uh, freight yards uh, in the east end of town, and burned. <laughs> Uh, 1949. Um, if you've seen the film, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about, oh, well, GM did this, and, you know, I think, I, I don't buy the conspiracy theory, but basically in 19, in the late 1940s, the streetcar system was 50 years old. It was old infrastructure, uh, streetcars weren't heated, uh, they were, I think it, it was, rather than put a major infusion of dollars in the streetcar system, gas was really cheap rubber tires were cheap. It's just a much more efficient system to go to uh, the, the, the bus system. But if you look at our bus system today, I would say that probably 60 or 70 percent of the lines in the municipal bus system, these are in the process of being changed, have their roots in the, in the streetcar, streetcar system. All right. Thanks, Tyler. Right. Thank sure. you. All right. Yeah, I believe he. Was, you know, he was only here a few years and then run out of town. And uh, I don't know that sort of intermediate history of the house after that. All right, so this is uh, James Barr.
Martin's mansion uh, that Bill Martin mentioned earlier. Um, it was built as a showpiece for the neighborhood. I think it was the first uh, large house built here. It was the early 1890s. And the streetcar line came right up the road we just came on. And it, it hooked a left on Poe, but at that time when you would have come over, you would have seen this, you know, right, right up in front of your face. And it would have been a pretty impressive selling point for the neighborhood, I think. Um, what you can't really see down there is that's actually that same um, Cannon Branch Creek. And when this house was built, there was an area down there. It's, it's now a public park. It's called Mitchell Springs. And way back in the day before this area was developed, that was sort of a wayside springs where people would come out and picnic, that sort of thing. And uh, my understanding is that when this house was built, it was a, a landscape terrace that overlooked this park. And it's hard to imagine now, but um, it's something to think about. Uh, we've actually been working with the owner of this property. At some point in the mid-century, uh, they added that large two-story wing, um, and it was an invalid's home. Uh, these folks bought it not too long ago. At the height of the real estate bubble, wanted to put uh, another rest home in the house and couldn't get the financing together. It's just a, a huge project. And so they're trying to sell it right now. Unfortunately, uh, this house would cost so much to rehab that in this market, there just aren't that many interested buyers. But um, I'll put a plug in. If you know anyone that's interested in Corner Miner, the Barton Mansion, um, it's available. <laughs> it's on the market. Um, so our next stop, we're going to curve around and stop at uh, a house. They call it the Wing Nut. It's uh, a local group that just moved up here recently. They're sort of self-professed anarchist, activist. Um, they have a little community garden, a little bike co-op. We're going to stop by there and they're going to give us a, a little spiel just to give you an idea of what's going on in the neighborhood now. Um, I don't know how incendiary she may or may not be, but it's adding some, I think, some positive energy to the neighborhood. So we'll we'll stop there and see what they have to say and, and continue I, I on. I have a real quick yeah, question. Sure. That I doubt that you can answer for me, but uh, that post. What's that? <laughs> I, I've got I've got the 1920 census, and my dad was a, less than a year old at that point, and he was born on Post Street. Okay. When I tried to find the number 1812. I couldn't find it. You, okay. Was it common for them to renumber? Yeah, a lot of like times that? when, especially in these areas, because they were independent cities for or towns for a little while, and when the city of Richmond annexed them, uh, they would have to change the numbers to match up with the numbers in the city. Uh -huh. In yeah, some so cases, at Highland Park, uh, for example, there was a Virginia Street at Highland Park, and they had to change the name because there was already another Virginia Street right. in the neighborhood. Okay. You can well, find out what the number was by the Sanborn maps that are available at the Virginia Library, or Library of Virginia downtown. Um, which is accessible online. You'll be able to pull up those maps and they show the old street address and the new one. Okay. Uh, what was the name of the... The Library of Virginia. Uh, no, Sanborn. 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 Fire insurance company. They would oh, make maps oh, okay. and the houses. If you look at trade emails, you know, Yeah. Okay. That, that's a more recent edition, okay. mid-century. Um, it was a uh, resto. <laughs> Almost. A little bit. A little bit. We're, we're on our last leg. Okay. Yeah, I looked at the map, but I couldn't tell which direction you were starting in. That's cool. Yeah, this is the wing nut, and this is our house. It's um, a radical collective, and so we live here, like, not as, like, a technical family, but, you know, friends who are all working on similar projects. And so um, we do stuff like Food Not Bombs out of the house, where we cook a meal once a week and take it to Midway Park and give it away to free whoever wants to eat it. And we started doing like a free kids breakfast on Friday morning since the kids are out of school for the summer and a lot of kids get their breakfast usually at school during the school year. Um, what else do we do? I don't know, we do like craft nights and movie nights and we have acoustic shows. Oh, oh he's, he's actually he's with, with us. us. Uh, he's, our, he's our sag wagon. Yeah. Right. Are the police cars with you? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> Pick up one along the way. The other one's against us. <laughs> They're all against us. Yeah. So tell, and you're, you're involved in the, the Civic Association here. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm the, the corresponding house. secretary of the Community Association for this neighborhood. And, and what's the, I know you've written about you're doing like sort of bicycle co-op. Yeah, we want to, um, we're trying to get it started because we need to get another space to like store bikes. But um, a lot of people in this neighborhood rely on bikes with bus system to go to grocery stores or whatever. But there's not a single bike shop anywhere. And there's not like a anywhere to fix up your bike. You know, you have to go far away to get that done, but if your bike's broken, 
you can't, and then you can't get to your job or the grocery store or whatever. So like, this is a neighborhood that we think would really benefit from having some like co-op sort of thing going on. Yeah. Yeah. Any any updates on? Uh, no, we're still working on a proposal for that property. Yeah, we're trying to buy the property across the street to renovate it because it's owned by the public housing authority, and they don't have a good process for like doing anything with their buildings. So we'd like to see that fixed up instead of just you know empty and dangerous. Not for profit, it's a complete money trap. But that one actually um. It's owned by a guy that's a street over. Yeah, we're we're actually working with him. Oh, yeah. He's in the process of rehabbing it. Yeah, it's going to look really nice. We got awesome. super excited when they started tearing down the nasty asbestos siding and revealing the wood. We're like, yes, yeah. that's it's great. House. Yeah. And your your house is great too. So yeah. Awesome. Who did the mural? We all did. All of us. Yeah. There's like the ten of us that worked on it. A few of the neighbors helped out with some drawings yeah. and stuff for it. Yeah, I think, I've never 1922. 22. Yeah. Um, when we bought it, it was condemned and um, and vacant, and it had like. I had to get the electrical and plumbing, we had to redo all those, and it had, it had lead paint, which is like one of the major issues with older houses, is like the lead paint abatement, and we were lucky because we did it before the EPA just changed all their stuff like a couple months ago, but we did it all ourselves, you know, acting as our own general contractor and doing the lead abatement ourselves, so it's possible, or at least it used to be. I'm not quite clear on the new rules that they've got on that, but... You do it by yourself, you don't have to You don't. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, you just have to have them come out a lot. Just be nice to your, the, the guy, the lead paint guy. <laughs> They'll love us, so we're yeah. doing, we did good that way. Well, thank, thanks a lot, but this is, I was telling these guys, this is kind of the, the sort of energy that I think is, is great to see. Yeah. yeah. The, city, the city refused to put trash cans um, oh, yeah. on our street, so we've been slowly buying and putting our own trash cans <laughs> awesome. in. Yeah. Uh, we, we do a trash cleanup, like, like maybe Every once other a week. week. Yeah. Ooh. Kids always help out. We have like 20 kids. Yeah, there are a lot of day, kids like in the eight, neighborhood. Like 13. Awesome Did you guys just get in touch with them by being out and around? Yeah. yeah. We first started hanging out with them actually when we were working on the garden. Some of the kids came up and they were like, "What you doing? Can I help?" We're like, "Yes, you totally can." Yeah, and um, and then they to I don't know if anyone knows about Facebook and that video game Farmville, but some of the kids were like, "This is just like Farmville." And I was like, oh, oh. "No, <laughs> Farmville is just <laughs> like this." Right, yeah, that's <laughs> the real thing. <laughs> Southside Community Development has a couple signs up and some other private developers have done some other things. So this is uh, Barton Heights Cemetery. Tyler mentioned it a little bit. Uh, it dates back to the uh, around 1815. Um, at the time, there were, I believe roughly, I may have this number wrong, but I believe it was around 2,000 uh, free men of color living in the city of Richmond. and. Uh, they wanted to have their own burial ground. Um, they didn't have it until that point. So they got together, uh, organized a group, um, and bought a parcel of land right over here. Uh, at the time, they called it the Phoenix Burial Ground, which I think is a very poetic name. Over the years, um, other, other similar groups, either uh, just freestanding groups of, of, of free black men or uh, groups affiliated with African American churches purchased other plots and what happens you ended up having roughly six different contiguous black uh, cemeteries on this 12 acre parcel. Um, some of the more notable people buried here um, or who were originally buried here uh, there was one guy and I'm blanking on his name but he was a barber uh, or maybe it was a blacksmith actually I can't remember but uh, one of the two and during the uh, theater fire at the, where the Monumental Church is now uh. on Broad Street. Uh, he rescued over a dozen people, um, and I think he ended up dying around 1840, and, and he's buried there. Um, another notable person that was buried there was uh, Reverend uh, John Jasper, or Jasper John. Uh, the Sunday Move. The su yeah, the Sunday Move, the famous sermon, and he would travel the country giving the sermon, um, and his home church is right over in Jackson Ward. He was buried here in 1901 when he died. Uh, 
apparently they had thousands of people out here and all sorts of dignitaries uh, commemorating the event. Um, unfortunately, uh, as the town of Barton Heights began to grow, uh, they started putting some pressure on the owners of the cemetery. They weren't too happy with the condition of it. I think part of it was there was a racial element. Barton Heights was an all-white town. They had this black cemetery in their midst, and uh, the town attorney brought a lawsuit against the cemetery, threatening to shut them down. Um, and what ended up happening was they, they resolved it so that the town of Barton Heights could set rules for the cemetery. They could have rules for when burials could happen, uh, rules for maintenance, upkeep, that sort of thing. Um, when the town was annexed by the city of Richmond, the, the city of Richmond also took over the cemetery. Um, and during the Great Depression, the uh, WPA was involved in some landscaping work, some of the things you see, that sort of thing. Uh, another unfortunate result of that decline is that a lot of the folks that were buried here were disinterred and reburied elsewhere. Um, Woodland Cemetery, uh, where Arthur Ashe is buried, just over that way is, is where some of these folks um, were later buried. Uh, and right now, I don't think a burial has taken place here since the 1970s, and the city of Richmond uh, is the entity in, in charge of its upkeep. Um, so if there aren't any questions, we'll uh, continue on our way. I, I'll point out, as we round this corner on, on Rose, if you look to your left, there's a really a uh, nice looking historic church building and house that you would normally not see just traveling out here because it's obscured by uh, this modern infill. Now, any more stops after this? Alright, so we're just going to wind our way back actually um, up to uh, the stone house. So.